Hi, it's Pete, Mind Wise Man's channel, aka Maverick Outdoors. And it's the pit of patter of the rain on the tarp. <laughs> One of the favourite outdoors sounds of bushcraft as wild campers. So it's the beginning of October and I've returned to the woods that I did the minimal camp out a couple of weeks ago, so if you saw that. This is a sort of a follow-on from that. I'm in the same location, but I've got a different tarp set up, a little bit more enclosed. Okay, so I'm going to rewind this video back to about four hours ago when I came into the woods and then returned to this spot. It's good practice to um, set up whatever type of shelter in bad weather, in inclement weather, because you never know when you can get caught out. So it's good to do that anyway. I was expecting maybe a little bit of rain earlier on, late afternoon, before dusky sort of twilight started to set in. But um, it didn't, but then came a little bit later when it wasn't forecast. So yeah, it's all good, put the waterproofs on, just took a little bit longer, but you know, as I say, it's good training to do that. And I don't want to have to start raising my voice too much <laughs> to go over the, the rain on the tarp, because it might bring attention if there's any late night walkers out. Okay, just give you a bit of a spec on what I've brought with me. A minimalist cook kit in here. My MRE, as it says in those three big letters, but it's not cheese vegetarian meal. This is what actually was contained in there. It's an American issue. But I've used the bag to put my own food pack in. A bit of old school. I haven't used this in a very, very long time. Bushcraft style. This was a set of about four different little leather pouches that were made for me by a guy um, on Facebook and on the bush, bushcraft forums and what have you and he was uh, making these up so he made me a set of four and this is what I use for my brew bag. I've got a postage bag that you've seen me use these before to put my rubbish in but initially I put in here just to keep all the moisture in because sometimes you get condensation when you take something out of the fridge. There's a little a fridgy, milky, slicey, what have you and inside there is going to be my main dinner for this evening, which is fresh, different from MREs and pre-cooked and what have you. There's a little freezer ice pack in there, which has kept this sort of nice and cool. I've cling film the top. In there I've got a chicken thigh, and in there I've got mushrooms, carrots, onion, garlic, uh, ginger. So I'm going to cook that up in the mess tin a little bit later on. And what I'm going to mix with that is something that I've got in there. 
the rain's still on the go, but it's died down a little bit. You can see I've got, I bought two lots, two lengths of camo netting with me this time, because I knew this area, and then how I was going to set up a slightly different tarp configuration, and then use the camo netting on both sides with obviously foliage and shrubbery that surround me draping over it. But I'll show you more about that in daylight. But while the audibility of the rain pitter pattering on top has died down slightly, I'll open up this little bag and show you what's in here. Similar to the most recent video of the minimalist kit, bug out lockdown stealth camp. But there you can see I've got, a bit different this time, the old um, pork scratchings. So there's the high calorie. Nice bit of salt content, savoury if you like this sort of thing, then it's spot on to have as a little munchy. Little sundries in there. You've seen these before as well. These were a few bits and pieces I'd left over from a couple of weeks ago when I was at this location. And I added a few more bits and pieces, so you will have seen this before. Okay, this is what's going to mix with the chicken. I saw this, the first time I've seen this. These are new from Asda. Barbecue beans, different types of um, grains and pulses in there. But this is already cooked, so I could actually eat this on its own. I think it's cold, but it ain't going to be that nice as maybe sort of like boiling a bag or just emptying it in a mess tin and heating it up and eating it warm, but of course that's going to be the base, I suppose if you want to call it carbohydrate, gravy, all the saucy stuff, to mix with the fresh chicken and vegetables I'll fry up first, then eventually add this. You'll have seen, last time I was out, when I mentioned about the corn nuts, and I told you a little story about those. I've found out a few things since, actually. I sort of looked into these and I was wondering why maybe these were crispy, but not as hard as the kernels the corn kernels that I had when I told you the story last time of uh, when I did Everest Base Camp. I found out these are actually, before these were actually made, they're soaked in water for up to three days, two to three days. And then they're sort of like just pat dried and then roasted. So something within obviously the soaking in the water makes these a little bit more crispy rather than picking them straight off the cob and then frying them in a pan like I was telling you about that my Sherpa Porter did when, um, or should I say that that's how he processed them in his Himalayan village and when he gave me some, he gave me energy. So I've actually cut these down. There I separated a pack, I think it was 175 grams. But this time, when I went to the supermarket where I got the lemon and chilli flavoured ones, I've got some of those as well, so I've got stock up of them, but I've actually batched them into small packs like you just saw there. And those ones are just uh, roasted, salted ones. So they're nice and savoury, I'm going to have some with some meat sticks like I did last time. So I've got a few of these now, where I've sectioned up with the uh, little bags that I make and then eventually seal with vacuum sealer, plastic bag. And these are the rest of the items that are in the bag. Oil to fry up and cook the fresh veg. Then I'm going to do the same as I had last time and I've got a uh, peanut butter and a fruit jelly which I'll put on biscuits brown which I'd use some sealed them back up so I'll finish those off with that. Those items speak for themselves. This is going to be probably with my breakfast, and what I've got for breakfast in the morning is an army issue ration pack, and it's just basic muesli with milk powder in it. But I've got one of these, and it's one of these yeah. sort of convenient, yeah, feel breakfast, breakfast in a bottle, they call them. It's like, really? What if he's feeding sparrows? Um, this is a chocolate version of a high fibre oat type based drink with oat milk and what have you, so I'm going to use that as extra calories to mix in with this, so I don't get to actually need water for this, and then you can just eat it out the sachet. So very much similar to the last camp out on this location, but just giving a bit of variety, but especially actually cooking up some fresh food. So I'm going to have to be a little bit careful, I'm going to do it later on this evening, just in case, again, I don't know if there's going to be any nutters out in this weather. Uh, when I looked out just now before it got really dark, it looked really misty, but it wasn't mist, it was just the downpour of the rain cascading through the trees. So, um, but you know, I just want to not be compromised, you know, Murphy's Law, whatever, if I was cooking up and not bothered about it, someone would probably come across me because those sort of scents and aromas uh, can travel and obviously get people's attention. I've got my little um, lighter that I use quite a lot that I attach to my Leatherman multi-tool, which again is the only tool I've brought. Oh no, sorry. Also, as you see that stainless steel basic, I think it's a 440 stainless steel, just like a massive great kitchen knife really, uh, that I've just braced up the end of the tarp. But I brought that, that was really handy. 
because it helped me to cut down a few bits and pieces around my shelter, sort of dead wood and what have you, rather than pulling it out bare hands, so I bought my gloves as well. Um, because obviously they're practical for some of the work I knew I was going to have to do around my pitch. But the saw device was on my Leatherman, so that still works. So I'm, getting, I'm quite liking that, actually. I quite like the novelty of something so small, pocket size, and yet it can do some pretty nifty work. But anyway, back to the matches. Um, I acquired a few packs these, so I thought I'd just bring them long-lasting, windproof matches. So I thought I'd use some of those up. But let's have a look and see what's in there. Okay, so this is Army, British Army issue. But as you see, that, that pulls out. Pull that up. Belt code at the top. And this is normally, as I say, used uh, British Army for a uh, canteen cup and maybe some sort of heating system. I've got everything I need for cooking in there. A couple of gel fuels. I just brought these because I can fit them in and they're really lightweight. Again, you've seen me use these before. These are sort of eco-friendly fire starters and you just break one of those off and they burn for about five minutes. So I thought I'll just bring one of those, or should I say a little block of these. They normally come in a pack that's about five, six times the size of this that I'm holding. So I thought, well, I could fit them in, they're lightweight, bring these, uh, just in case I was going to do a stick fire on the Hexi, just for the sake of it. And obviously those eco fire lighters would get it going. And then in size, I'll pull this out to stop it rattling around. I've got bits of tissue in there, but there's a gel, gel fuel. Everything else self-contained in there. That was on that side to stop the metal of the hexi stove from rattling. Then I've got a antibacterial wet wipe underneath, which then cushioned it. But as you can see, that speaks for itself there. This is stainless steel. And this one's got a support that you can put on top that you can see the shape. It's a bit too large for underneath this Dutch Army stainless steel. This is um, half a litre, 500 mil. But this does the three quarters of a litre, 750 mil, for the British Army, and it sort of fits in there. And then, of course, you can cook up any food, make a brew, or heat up the water. Obviously, it's much bigger, the British Army. You can see the shape sort of fits, but what I do is I take it across like that so it balances. But any water that you might be heating up with whatever fuel device in this folding stove, uh, you might put an MRE, meal ready to eat, boiling up in there. But obviously, this one's a bit small. I've done it. Again, follow my travels, you've probably seen me do it many moons ago. Uh, but obviously the bigger one, that's another half a size bigger in volume than this, will fit in there. And of course the water volume would be much bigger. Hence it would be a little bit more practical to heat up and then use the water that's left over, as a lot of people tend to do, for either a brew or soup. Or just mixing it with something else, because you've heated it up and boiled it, to heat up the pack of food, um, rather than discard the water, especially if you're... Um, sparse of it then obviously you're going to use the water and as the majority of you are going to know that's exactly what the hexi stove looks like I've got eight blocks in there four then another row underneath in this pack a sealed up pack and then as you can see this will go on top and then once that's going canteen cup will go on there but as I say the bigger one the army issue I can put that there but, you know, if it's not that stable, I'd rather have it where it's bracing and bridging either side of my half a litre cup. Down this little section here, I've got a lid for my canteen cup that I made out of a couple of, I think, steak and kidney pie foil trays. You know, they come in the box, take them out, put them in the oven, and I just mould it out of that. And that just fits on top and heats up much quicker and uses less fuel. And the only eating utensils I brought is this one spoon I use to mix up my food and eat with, and also a little spoon that's in my brew pouch there, just to keep it convenient and separate. Just a little thing with these matches, uh, just for convenience, so they still stay self-contained even when you start using them. I just made a little hole in the end and just pulled one of these out, so unless you sort of faff around with them, they're not going to come out, and then just cut the end where the striking strip is, and then when I've finished I can actually slide it back in, and then just keep that all as one unit, so it's convenient and it's still relatively protected. So I just struck the match and put it on top of the gel fuel, and I've got about two thirds of that full with water. And that will maybe take about five, six minutes. 
and while that's boiling up I'll show you what's in my brew pouch, bushcraft style. <laughs> so I've got my homemade malted chocolate, actually it was a malt drink. I didn't have any of my Milo left over that I uh, mentioned in my last previous camp out a couple of weeks ago. So I've um, bought some malted drink, which is a bit like Horlicks but has this version. Then I mixed half of it with like Maltesers chocolate drink, instant and then mixed it with the Nilo full cream milk powder and sugar. So that's a choco drink that I'll have or normally have it as a midnight snack. I've got some uh, pre-done uh, three-in-ones. So I've, I've got some in stock, in storage of my own make, but I thought I'd just bring these for convenience. And then because of the little bits of plastic I had left to make these bags with the vacuum sealer bag plastic there was a few sort of odds and sods that I had left over so I was able to make these two it was one piece of plastic which I was able to make these two out of sorry can't count three those two milk and sugar and then the chocolate but I didn't have enough room to fit two loose tea bags one there and one there like I did last time so I brought separate tea bags and another couple just there and um, so I was able to use up this bit of plastic rather than using some that was actually off of the roll because this was a little oddment that was left over. So that's how that worked out. But as I say, all that went in me bushcraft style brew pouch. I always keep my sleep kit packed away until right the last minute when I'm ready to literally go to sleep. So if I didn't need to pack up, it's just one less thing. The worst thing is, okay, so if I'm going to inflate my mat, but then packing your sleep kit away and all that sort of thing. So I will, for convenience and comfort, get my inflatable mat out in a little while so I can inflate it to the full length, then deflate slightly, fold it in half so it's a nice cushion seat for the ground. And then if I want to lay back and just contemplate, the rain, the autumn turning weather. But meanwhile, I'm gonna get those down my throat. Ah, yummy, snack wise. <laughs> As you know, if you follow my stuff, uh, part of my sleep kit is softy trousers and softy jacket. Right, well I've got an extra pair of softy trousers that I had for my son for when he comes out with me. Um, not that he's extra large or anything, but they happen to be a bigger size than the ones I normally wear. So they can go over the top of my first pair of softy trousers. So instead of wearing, um, having a sleeping bag draped over me, unzipping it and draping it over as the extra layer compared to what I had last time when I was here. The temperature's dropping uh, and it is feeling much more cooler in the air. So that's why I brought also my NBC jacket. <laughs> Not that I'm expecting any nuclear fallout or anything, but I'll explain a little bit more uh, where I've actually washed the charcoal out of the garments uh, because obviously they're a protective membrane and how lightweight also they dry easily as well and how warm and thermal they are considering the thickness and the lightness of them. So if you're aware or know of NBC suits, jackets, trousers, either or, or both nuclear, biological, chemical warfare overgarments that the uh, military use, these are the trousers I got blinking about 12 years ago. And obviously they're camo and they've got a little bit of Velcro at the side that then fastens. They have the thinner material, it's quite thin, it's sort of a synthetic. I tried to dye these. Uh, to make them a little bit more urban with black dye but it didn't have it so that means they're fully synthetic. I went to do it with a um, cold water dye which does certain synthetic fibres mainly cotton and wool and uh, it didn't work so I actually used that dye to actually dye my cargo military trousers 
to make them a darker shade but more about that another time but you can see then the inner layer has got sort of like a, a meshy membrane to it and impregnated into that which I've washed out would be the car uh, the charcoal uh, covering which is then the lining of the inside of these trousers as you see the woodland camo pattern but what I've found out since is there's actually three layers that's why these are so warm I've got a green pair as well and I found these really warm some of my favorite trousers for lightweight trekking breathable uh, dry easily if they do get wet and you didn't get a chance to put your waterproofs over the top but since the uh, since I've washed them out for well, obviously over the years the actual meshy membrane has separated from another I think uh, non man made fibre um, which that meshy membrane is actually embossed onto or impregnated onto or somehow sort of blended into but now it's all been washed out they've separated so there's actually three layers to these tra trousers if that sort of makes sense <laughs> if you could know anything about thermal clothing it will do bag synthetic bag you know I've put a sleeping bag in it's sort of a compression sack but the straps aren't actually on it so but it's all right for what I need to choose today and what I've got for today just give me that extra lightweight but thermal layer is my green jacket of the NBC suit and then the softy trousers the slightly larger ones that will go over my normal ones that I usually wear so I'm gonna have two layers so I can, at least I can move around if I need to uh, you know if anything happens during the night and I've got to move I'm not having to sort of derail a bit of a unzipping out of a sleeping bag and what have you and I just want to try this out having two layers two pairs of softy trousers as these are a bit bigger they're going to fit over my other ones quite easily but I'm going to put that jacket on now because I've got my t-shirt and I've got this fleece so wearing my t-shirt when I tracked in but I've just got this brown simple fleece just sort of zips up at the neck and it's quite a nice layer on top of the t-shirt so as you can see from the comparison of the size of my hand it sort of rolls up quite small but for its thermal value and two big pockets on the chest so I'll leave my softy trousers in there till later on when I actually need them but you can see there's the sleeves of the jacket uh, velcro just tighten it up same the other side two big chest pockets really bomb proof really great chest pockets it's got a zip and then velcro in the front of it but I never zip up my clothing when I'm storing it ready for use when I'm out on the trail. Um, I just have whatever I can if it's buttons so then I can open it quickly if I need to put it on rather than faff around with getting a zip, especially waterproofs. And then the hood. Now I featured this before a long, long time ago. But again, if you're versed with the um, NBC suits, you're going to know that the hood goes up quite up it sort of deforms its shape and goes up at an angle as I move my camera to sort of define that uh, but what I did I adjusted it and I sewed a little peak into it so if you see me wearing this with the hood up and you know about NBC suits you're going to know how much this has been altered so it's more for sort of day wear outdoors out on the trail and of course for tonight Now here's a good example, I can show you, this is the sort of thin material which I say dries really quick and then the inside membrane would have had charcoal on it, this would have been sort of like a dark grey colour but when I first got these I actually really washed them out by hand in cold water, warm water. At least half a dozen times all the NBCs, the two that I've got, um, but you can see this has got lighter because all of the uh, impregnated charcoal was washed out when I bought them, which I did myself. Um, but obviously over a period of time it's got even lighter and it's worn a little bit. But I thought it was two layers, this with the impregnated charcoal and then this outside. But over a period of time since I've been washing them, especially my trousers, I noticed that this sort of fibrous membrane came away from another layer that this was attached to separate from the outside so just to sort of reiterate i thought it was two layers this inside charcoal embedded layer and then the outside but since this has actually started to wear and what have you and sort of got much softer there's two layers here besides this one on the outside so i think that's why in its lightness um, the three layers just sort of sandwich that little bit of warm air just enough thickness 
with the three layers just enough uh, to make it more thermal than if it was say just one piece of material say this thickness and just one layer but this being the same thickness but with three layers compared to just a single piece of material if that makes sense I think creates the thermal quality and that's what I've noticed over the years when wearing these clothes problem with the gels, I just lit that as normal, looked like any other gel. Peeled off the lid, put the match to it, but it's obviously started to disintegrate and spread out over the base of the hexi stove, which has then made the flame much bigger, engulfing around the sides, and it will probably burn out quicker, because obviously if it split and spread the gel over the base, it wasn't actually staying sort of in a nice condensed little lump to burn at a consistent rate. So that's one of the sort of negative things with the gel. So as you can see, I'm doing the, the veg first because they'll take a little bit longer to cook. Then I'll sort of bring them all to one side or one end of the mess tin and then I'll put the chicken in that end, start to cook it, then mix it together. Then once it's all cooked through, I'll add that sachet of concoction of beans and grains in that barbecue sauce. So now that started to die down now and that wasn't even going for three four minutes. So I've broken off one of the eco fire lighters and you can see that's burning at a nice steady pace. So that will cook through quite evenly with a nice steady heat without scorching or burning as long as I keep stirring. So back to the eco-friendly, fibrous, woody, paper mache, whatever it's made out of compacted uh, little block. Now that's been going for nearly four minutes now and it's been a nice steady heat. So I reckon they're just as good as half a hexi block without actually smoking up the uh, base of whatever cooking utensil you're using, which hexi stove, uh, sorry, hexi blocks tend to do and uh, obviously there's less aroma from that little block. But obviously that aroma, I just hope there's no one. So I've just gone half past ten at night, walking around thinking, where's that smell in the cooking coming from? Right in the middle of these woods, don't make sense. <laughs> oh yeah, and one more thing with a little bit of cook craft. The length, obviously they're oblong shaped, the stove, so the oblong length of it, I've got in line with the oblong length of the mess tin. Just makes it more efficient. Yeah, of course you can turn it at different angles. But if you want a consistent, just leaving it there for a while and having it in line, parallel, sort of within the oblong shape. So the oblong mess tin matches the oblong alignment of the folding stone. <laughs> Okay, so there we have it. A bit of cordon bleu cooking <laughs> on the Hexi stove. Minimal little pocket cook kit. And the old um, steam is probably not letting you sort of define what it now looks like, but you can see it looks very scrummy. Come yummy. Well, that's going down my throat now. Uh, coming up at just before 11 o'clock at night.
Good Sunday morning. Now you can see what the inside of the tarp setup's like. A bit more enclosed than last time I was here. It's about 9.30 in the morning. So I eventually, after I'd settled for a couple of hours, I sort of stirred during the night and I thought actually I can just feel a little bit of a chill factor. So I put my second pair of softy trousers on. But I'd already had my softy jacket over my NBC jacket. As you can see I've got the hood on top of my buff. So I had that to start with. And then later on when I really settled for the night and I wanted it to be nice and thermal warm, I put my amended hood. As you can see, I used the mat, same mat I used last time. But what I did, I folded the pillow underneath to make sort of this pillow section higher. So it just gives me a little bit more of a comfortable angle. So I didn't have to actually put anything underneath the pillow to bridge it up a little bit. So now it's pre-packed little sachet of muesli with bottled fibre drink breakfast time. So I've put about just over half of the fibre drink in there and I'll just leave it to soak for a couple of minutes just to sort of hydrate it just that little bit more. I mean you can eat it straight away just like a bowl of cereal but I just want it to be a little bit more stodgy and that will go down my throat to start the day. I'm going to knock up a 3-in-1 brew on my Hexi stove in a little while but what I thought I'd do is I'd just dilute this down because this is quite obviously as you'd expect sort of quite a thick um, consistency drink because of the nature of what the contents are and what it is. So to make this my replacement for a beverage, a brew, I'm just going to mix some water in there. For me water to go it's easy, I can just pour it from the spout and fill it up to maybe about three quarters and then that'll be my drink uh, for my breakfast as well. As you're probably aware the old softy trousers have got a big zip along the side so you can actually put them on straight over while you're wearing your boots and any clothing obviously that's underneath. The zip goes right up to about here on both sides. Voila! To expose the first pair I had on. <laughs> So it's a double layer instead of using a lightweight sleeping bag. So at least I could get up during the night if I had to unexpectedly. So for those of you that aren't that acquainted with the softy jacket and trouser system, they're reversible. So obviously I'm wearing the green surface for where I am. But if you're in sort of desert type uh, environment or a lighter coloured environment, then it's reversible. You can turn it inside out. There's pockets on this side as well and zipper pockets. So you've got two on the outside the green and two on the outside waist level of the sandy colour. As I say, reversible jacket and trousers. What I like to do with the stuffed sacks of anything really, especially my sleep kit, so obviously that's for the softy jacket, that's slightly bigger, that's for one pair of the softy trousers, the ones I normally bring with me. Um, and this is the bag for the inflatable mat. Because the inflatable mat was the first thing I got out to utilise for part of my sleeping system, I then used this to store all the other bags in so I like to keep all of my sleep kit stuff bags containment bags all in one bag so you don't lose them don't misplace them and you're more organized to know when and where you can get them when you need them so that's the softy jacket done but what's a, a good idea as well which I like to do is just obviously without bringing attention to yourself as if you're waving a flag around <laughs> shake any little bits of dust or there could be any little creepy crawlies without mentioning anything specific you don't want to be taking those home so as best as you can that was just a little bit of leaf there I sort of turned them inside out once I zipped up the sides just gave them a bit of a shake kept them close to me and then when I put them in the stuff bag there's less chance of me taking home anything that I don't want encased in my clothing Fasten buttons and do the zips up any fastenings before you pack them away. Always a good idea. Then things don't get tangled up and it just makes it more tidy and easier to process putting them away. If and when things start getting loose in your rucksack, I brought this extra little bag just on top of when I packed everything away in the rucksack before I set off. Um, but then as you start moving things around, some things can get a bit loose. So what I've put in here is so I just take the bag out with all the small little oddments. Uh, is some antiseptic cream, a couple of um, 
tissues, wet wipes, my binoculars and a couple of other bits and bobs so I know that me small little bits and bobs I don't want to get, well, I've got to take everything out to try and find something that big at the bottom uh, I put in there so that's just another little good technique to do with the rest of your kit uh, from the last wild camp so if you want a little bit more info a bit more detail then check the previous video to this one you're watching and it gives a breakdown of basically all the things that I need least of all like my sleep kit not till the end of the day things that I need access to during the day I keep at the top like my sleep kit certain clothing first aid kit food um, my cooker little cooker kit and a couple of technical bits and pieces like batteries for the head torch and my wet um, waterproofs uh, jacket and trousers there's the jacket there but I'll explain a little bit more about why I brought this rucksack with me and what it's called and what it's initially originally was used for. So we're in my NBC clobber which I explained about under the basher last night. How I sort of processed them once I'd actually acquired them. I've got the camo version of them, so they've got really big strong pockets. Like bellows pockets and then the jacket as well with two chest pockets as you can see. Lightweight and the hood. So if you know the shape of the hood, because it normally the gas mask goes underneath it, so it's got quite a peak at the top here, whereas obviously I've reduced that. And I've actually made a little peak at the front, um, just reduced it, so it's a little bit more urban wear. Reduced it, so it's a little bit more urban wear. And where the Velcro goes up, it obviously really seals nice and warm but I can actually roll the hood up and actually make a collar as you can see here so I've got the peak that I've made and rolled it inwards and then it's about sort of four or five times and then I know that's got the right shape for it to be a nice high collar NBC suits are used sort of uh, for leisurely activities especially fishermen I mean I know about the um, jackets and trousers and the NBC format of the actual clothing um, but I'd never sort of thought of maybe using it for outdoors use. So this, um, I think this, the green jacket and the matching trousers that I sometimes wear like separate, might wear the green trousers with other different clothing that's not NBC, um, I think was about £10. And the camo one was about £8. And so I got them both about 12 years ago. Uh, you can still pick them up for a reasonable price nowadays, maybe 15, 20 quid. Um, but sometimes it's whether or not you can get the right size but you really want a big fit so they can go over your um, other layers of clothing but then if it's sort of warm weather but just a little bit cool and you still want to wear it for practicality lightweight um, you can sort of cinch it in a little bit and reduce the size from the velcro that's on the sleeves and also at the sides there So the NBC trousers don't come with the zip fly, but they've got this sort of fold up pleat bit that goes across the front and then you velcro it. Now the two loops at the front, they're the only ones there are on these type. So obviously the belt can thread through, but then what I did from the top here, there's also like a braces made out of canvas webbing. So the canvas webbing is actually sewn into the back about sort of just either side of the middle of your back, about sort of three, four inches either side, and then the webbing uh, canvas material comes over the top, and then you just loop it into, or do some sort of tying device. You'd normally thread it through there, thread the other one through there, and then tie it in a reef knot or uh, like a, a shoe tie at the front. What I did out of that little bit of canvas webbing, I made two. Uh, belt loops at the back and sewn those on. We should be able to see them there. I'll just briefly go into a couple of details of where I amended, as this is the second time I've been here, and the first time I'd not been here before and I hadn't sort of wrecked it, just sort of looking round. There's a couple of adjustments I made to focal point of places where the public are, the public access pathways, which are about anything from 100 metres, depending on what direction, to 150 metres. I could see an open part of view, and again, unless you're looking for me, you're not going to know I'm here. But I thought what I would do for the sake of it, somewhere over there, which is slightly open towards where my basher is, I thought I'd do a little setup of a screen with uh, bits of 
sort of a tripod bits of wood and then just laying some bracken over it. But here's the setup of the basher. As I say it's a little bit different to last time. I've got two camo nets coming around the side here. Obviously my opening here, but the point of view in relation to the front where I would sit was just here. So there was a slight sort of a lower bit of ground. I just set this up. So if you imagine when I'm sitting at my basher, that becomes a bit of a screen. So it just makes it less likely that I could be seen randomly. Also there was a bit more exposure when I scanned around and sort of panned around to have a look. So just that area there, I also did the same thing with some sort of tripod bits of stick and some bracken over it so it sort of blocks that. So as best as possible I've got a reasonable sort of straight line without any dips as such to actually mask where I am. Top view you can see where I've got it braced up, clip on to that bit of branch there. So I didn't have to go walk about and find any bits of stick, specific ones. I put my four section pole and then also you can see here is my walking pole that was kindly given to me oh, quite a few years ago now from Darren Frankie Prepper when I was hobbling around before I had my hip surgery, leg surgery. So I used that just to help sort of trek into the woods and uh, then also use that as a basher pole which as you can see is on part of the centre point comes up and then I've got the guy line coming down to here but it also gives an aspect for the camera netting to be draped as well and there's a better aspect of inside it's more encased it's a little bit more sheltered than the one I did a couple of weeks ago so from a distance it's not really going to be picked out. Next time I'll probably within this foliage, because it's the autumn colours, it's a brown. One side of the netting is like brown and green and the other side is a little bit more green. So when I was sort of looking around I think maybe the green side might have worked just a little bit well, a little bit better because there's still more greenery and the bracken hasn't quite sort of browned off and gone into its autumn colours. So you can just about see the difference as I show both sides. This is more sort of brown but the green comes through of where the cutting openings are. But I don't know if the light or the shade will actually show it but then when you bring it the other side you can see it's a little bit more green so I think that's the colour I would use at this time of year until everything goes autumn brown. And there's that little tripod sticks and bracken screen from where I'm actually sitting just in front of the basher now. So it just makes it, I just thought I'd just make that little additional extra just looking round. Just making a final brew of the day. You can see that that's a nice equal steady pace of heat, steady flame. That's half of a hexi block. And I'll put the other half in if it doesn't quite boil it up. But it's got a nice consistent heat and I know at least that one block's going to get me to where I want and that's that water boiling to make me final brew of a Sunday afternoon. Oh yeah just a final thing on any sort of fuel really but considering it's been the hexy stove this weekend uh, it's the ambient temperature that's around as well I mean if it was really cold there was a slight breeze and obviously it would take much longer to process the heating to either cook or boil water but because it's very mild, um, I'm going to get the full effect of heating up within a good time. There you go, in less than five minutes, boiling up the water. So it's just over half a block, but that'll still keep burning for another two, three minutes at least. So that half a block, say in the right conditions, will boil up easily half a litre of water in sort of clement weather conditions where the atmosphere is mild etc. So 
if that needed any more, I'd add another little block on it if it was a bigger vessel to boil up. But the hexi blocks, I know they do set up the utensils and what have you, and there's a little bit of a aroma that's stronger than any other type of the, oh, the eco gel fuels and all that. But they're so much more efficient. So I decided to have two, so I'm like a nice strong, rich flavoured one of the, the um, commercial three in ones. But another sort of like a little tip don't cut the top of any sachet, any packet, all the way off. This I just sort of tore, leave it still linked on. Obviously, it's not going to get in the way to stop pouring whatever it is, whether it's liquid, MRE foods, or in this case, the powder of the hot drink. Just keep it still attached rather than if you cut the whole thing off, you know, little bits of rubbish go flying about and you've got to find where it is. And I'm always on about leave no trace and even just the top of that on its own, as far as I'm concerned, you take it home, put it in your domestic rubbish. So not cutting it right off, but still keeping it attached so you're never losing any rubbish. Pocket kits, cook kits, small kits to cook and heat your food. The old folding handle, canteen cup, use it to make a drink or prep water to then add to other stuff, eat out of it, drink out of it. <laughs> so for sort of minimal utensils and kit, folding handle canteen cup, whether it's this one or the British Army, any type that fits in with your bottles and other kit while I just let the sun cascade through the camo netting and through the trees and final high calorie snack of the day I'm not going to make any dinner I'm going to have it when I get home it's coming up to about 4 o'clock in the afternoon so that's the peanut butter from the sachet and also the strawberry jelly on top of a biscuits brown so I'll get those down my throat and then I'm going to strike down camp. So before I pack up for the day, I've taken off the camo netting so you can actually see the fixings properly, sort of square on in situ. I'm keeping my voice down a little bit because well, there's a leisurely aircraft, so I'll try and be above that. But there's a few people, I heard voices nearby, so it must be on one of the nearest paths, about 100 metres away. But you can see the fixings here and it's actually based on the principle that I then converted it because this is a three meter by two and it's based on a square, uh, a true square tarp, three by three, four by four, five by five and it works like this. From that corner, bring this up to here and then this was my main fixing to start with which then had a diagonal going down and a diagonal going that way. I had to get the right striations so I could get that little bit at the back so it's a nice little, little slight box shape inside there although there's an angle but it's a nearest sort of comparison I can give it and then this one here but you can see inside there where it's those two fixings only to the ground and then that one over there and then everything is then pulled up from it to create this configuration I know it's a very crude way of explaining it but it's the only way that I could um, without actually putting it up again because obviously I did it last night. I couldn't film it because it was absolutely pouring down with rain. So anyway, I hope that makes sense. But getting a better concept, just final time from the rear. Obviously I can bring the front down, readjust it if I needed to, if the weather really kicked up in Clement. I found some firmer stick that wasn't no, uh, necessarily rotten, but it was firm enough to make an improvised little tent peg with my leather, Leatherman multi-tool. You can see that's one there, the which was on the back, just to bring this out, give it a bit of striation. And one on the front corner. We've taken the four section pole down on this corner here, which is quite handy, because there's a little sort of handle to it, tent peg, <laughs> pushing it in. So I had to improvise with those, because I only brought six tent pegs, which I thought initially would do me, but then also making contingencies to know that you can procure and make your own if necessary, bushcraft style. So now it's coming up to five o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, put up a little bit of body warmth while striking down the camp and then packing up my bag. Um, so as always, leave no trace as best as possible. So unless you knew I was here, 
you don't know I was here. And just a brief spec on the kit bag that I used this weekend. It's army issue. I have used it before and given a bit of an explanation on it. Uh, so this was gifted to me from my nephew. And you can see there's some straps underneath webbing with clips where I've put the uh, basher set up, my shelter kit. But this is called Other Arms, or nicknamed the turtle back because it looks like a turtle's shell, or engineer's pack. So Other Arms, engineer's pack, or nicknamed the turtle. When I did a stealth wild camp, or oh, it must have been about, I think about 18 months ago, uh, I used this pack for the first time, but it's also got the zip fastenings for the rocket pouches. The 10 litres rocket pouches that got a zip lid that can fix either side. And I did actually use those the last time that I used this, but I actually took all and sundry when I did that wild camp. Obviously there's the shoulder straps. It's also got a belt strap, but I don't use that. Padding there across the waist. And it's also got a flap that I've got tied up, which if it was being used as a, just a carry bag, to conceal the straps nice and tidy so nothing snags. This unrolls and you can see it's got Velcro down the sides and then conceals all of that with this flap that comes over it. So it's quite good and it also, all right, so it hasn't got compartments to it as far as the main section, but it's got a good zip that comes down nearly about halfway so you've got a good opening to get access to everything. So I'm now ready for about a mile and a half trek, two miles nearly. Uh, impersonate a turtle <laughs> with that rucksack on me back. So off I jolly well go, back into the woods to take myself back to bricks and mortar. So I hope you found this video of interest. Obviously, again, as always, maybe a, a different type of approach to the same subject of wild camping and stealth camping, but obviously there were different elements to this one in comparison to the one that if you watched it two weeks ago, uh, the video previous to this. So the same sort of similarities but I wanted to change it and make it a slightly different version as you've obviously seen. NBC suit <laughs> while camping in it with Hexi stove. So as always thanks for watching. Really appreciate your interest and catch you in another video soon. Cheers. Take care.